Load balancing. Huge shout out to Sam Hu for writing this one. I've heard really good things and I'm genuinely really excited because load balancing is one of those things that is difficult, not well understood, and incredibly important to keeping the internet alive. Let's take a look. Past a certain point, web applications outgrew a single server deployment. Companies either want to increase their availability, scalability, or both. To do this, they deploy their applications across multiple servers with a load balancer in front to distribute incoming requests. Big companies may need thousands of servers running their web applications to handle the load. In this post, we're going to focus on the ways that a single load balancer might distribute HTTP requests to a set of servers. We'll start from the bottom and work our way up to modern load balancing algorithms. Ooh boy. This will be fun. Visualizing the problem. Let's start at the beginning. A single load balancer sending requests to a single server. Requests are being sent at a rate of one request per second, and each request reduces in size as the server processes it. These graphics are really good. I have a good feeling about this already. For a lot of websites, this setup works fine. Modern servers are powerful and can handle a lot of requests. But what happens if they can't keep up? You'll see the red ones are failing because it couldn't keep up because it was still processing the green when the red hit. Here we see that a rate of three RPS causes some requests to get dropped. If a request arrives at the server while another request is still being processed, the server will drop it. This will result in an error being shown to the user and is something we want to avoid. We can add another server to our load balancer to fix this. So here's the load balancer sending requests back and forth between the two servers. I also love the use of color here where a red request is a dropped one, a green one's a good one, and the load balancer is represented in the black color here. And as we see here, we have no more dropped requests. The way our load balancer is behaving, sending a request to each server in turn, is called round robin load balancing. It's one of the simplest forms of load balancing, and it works great when your servers are all equally powerful and your requests are all equally expensive. And here's the same example, but with way more servers and way more requests. But they're already hinting here, when your servers are all equally powerful and your requests are all equally expensive, that's a lot of bold assumptions. And they are certainly not always true. When round robin doesn't cut it. In the real world, it's rare for servers to be equally powerful and for requests to be equally expensive. Even if you use the exact same server hardware, performance may differ. Applications may have to service many different types of requests, and these will likely have different performance characteristics. I'll give the quick example of upload thing here, where when users are uploading on upload thing, we have to check if they've went over the size of the number of things they're allowed to upload. They might be capped at two gigs, 100 gigs, or way more depending on what plan they're on. And we also have to check more files when we confirm that if you have 100 gigs worth of files, that might take longer for us to check. And just the run of the query to get the current size limit takes longer for some users than others. So none of our requests are actually going to be exactly the same, even if they're hitting the same exact hardware. So when you vary the cost of the request, as I just described there, in the following simulation, requests aren't equally expensive. And you'll see that some requests take longer and you end up with some bouncing. Because if one of the requests here takes longer and then it gets hit by another message soon after before the last one's completed, it doesn't matter that you're round robining. It doesn't even matter that you have other servers that have availability because availability isn't based on when it's done. It's based on things just getting hit in order. And while most requests in this example are getting served successfully, we are dropping some. One way we can mitigate this is to have a request queue, where each of these servers now has a queue. When you hit things at certain ones, the work gets queued up. What you'll see here is way fewer things are getting dropped, but when you hit the max queue on one of these servers, you will still drop things sometimes. And also an important detail here is if one of your requests happens to hit, like that guy there who hit the end of that queue, there were other open servers he could have hit and that request could have been resolved faster, but it wasn't because the round robin rule happened to hit a box that was on a queue. Th these diagrams are incredible. Huge shout out to the author for the work he's put into these. Be sure to check out the link in the description because this is a lot of work. Request queues help us deal with uncertainty, but it's a trade-off. We'll drop fewer requests, but at the cost of some requests having higher latency. That's way better put than what I just said. If you watch the above simulation long enough, you might notice that requests subtly change color. The longer they go without being served, the more their color will change. You'll also notice that thanks to the request cost variance, servers start to exhibit an imbalance. Queues will get backed up on servers that get unlucky and have to serve multiple expensive requests in a row. And if a queue is full, the requests will just get dropped. Everything said above applies equally to the servers that vary in power. The next simulation will also vary the power of the servers, which is represented visually with a darker shade of gray. Now this guy is getting requests dropped all the time and they take way too long to resolve. These ones, when they get hit, resolve the request immediately. The servers are given random power values, but the odds are some are less powerful than others and quickly start to drop requests. At the same time, the more powerful servers sit idle most of the time. This scenario shows the key weakness of round robin, variance. Despite its flaws, however, round robin is still the default HTTP load balancing method for Nginx. Yeah, 
crazy to think that as obviously flawed as round robin is, it's still the default and the standard for so many things. So we should talk about how we can improve on it. It's possible to tweak round robin to perform better with variants. There's an algorithm called wait. Oh, first mistake this is it crazy. Cause this article's had like no mistakes so far. And there's finally a typo. I actually have some feedback to give this author who wrote this incredible thing. So yeah, delete one of the called Sam, not a big deal. Anyways, there's an algorithm called weighted round robin, which involves getting humans to tag each server with a weight that dictates how many requests to send to it. In the simulation, we use each server's known power value as the weight, and we give more powerful servers more requests as we loop through them. Interesting, you can clearly see here, these ones get one request at a time, these ones get two requests at a time, this one gets three requests at a time. It's a nice, quick improvement. We'll still drop things when certain boxes get hit too hard, and you really wanna be in the group that hits this server, because otherwise your request will take way longer. Like you can see how much comically longer this request takes than one that hits this box, which gets resolved immediately. While this handles the variance of server power better than the vanilla round robin, we still have request variants to contend with. In practice, getting humans to set the weight by hand falls apart quickly. Boiling server performance down to a single number is hard and would require careful load testing with real workloads. This is rarely done, so another variant of weighted round robin calculations weighs dynamically by using proxy metrics, latency. Stands to reason that if one server serves requests three times faster than another, it's probably three times faster and should receive three times more requests. So here we see this one takes 2.2 seconds, this one takes 0 0.6, probably take more requests then. He's added text to each server this time that shows the average latency of the last three requests served. We then decide whether to send one, two, or three requests to each server based on the relative differences in their latencies. The result is very similar to the initial weighted round robin, but there's no need to specify the weight of each server up front. This algorithm will also be able to adapt to changes in server performance over time. This is called the dynamic weighted round robin. Let's see how it handles a complex situation with high variance in both server power and request cost. The following simulation uses randomized values, so feel free to refresh the page a few times to see it adapt to new variants. Ooh, interesting. Are these all coded dynamically then? I just assumed these were GIFs. No, these are embedded canvases. Okay. That's really cool that it changes every time. Notice how fast this one is, so it sends a ton to it. The rest are a bit slower, so they get less. Very interesting. Moving away from round robin. Dynamic weighted round robin seems to account well for variants in both server power and request cost. What if I told you we could do even better and with a simpler algorithm? Interesting. This seems to be working really well, but the order it's sending things changes a ton. Huh. This is called least connections load balancing. Oh, that makes sense. Because the load balancer sits between the server and the user, it can accurately keep track of how many outstanding requests each server has. Then when a new request comes in and it's time to determine where to send it, it knows which server has the least work to do and it prioritizes those. This algorithm performs extremely well, regardless of the variance cost. It cuts through uncertainty by maintaining an accurate understanding of what each server is doing. It also has the benefit of being very simple to implement. Let's see this in action with a similarly complex situation. The same parameters we gave the dynamic weighted round robin above. Again, these parameters are randomized within given ranges. So refresh the page a few times to see the new variants. So here it's literally just picking whichever box has nothing in the queue and just spamming it until there are things in its queue and then move to the next one. And it's not dropping anything anymore. It's not immune, but you'll notice the only time this algorithm drops requests is when there is literally no more queue space available. So if this managed to fill all of the queues, then it would start dropping things. But as long as something has some space in its queue, this will never drop requests. So as long as you've accommodated for your peak potential traffic with your queues and your boxes, you should be good here. And as the author says here, it will make sure all available resources are in use and that makes it a great default choice for most workloads. Absolutely agree. Optimizing for latency. Up until now, I've been avoiding a crucial part of the discussion, what we're optimizing for. Implicitly, I've been considering dropped requests to be really bad and seeking to avoid them. This is a nice goal, but it's not the metric most want to optimize for in an HTTP load balancer. What we're often more concerned about is latency. This is measured in milliseconds from the moment a request is created to the moment it's been served. When we're discussing latency in this context, it is common to talk about different percentiles. For example, the 50th percentile, also called the median, is defined as the millisecond value for which 50% of requests are below and 50% are above. Usually we measure 95th percentile, but 50th percentile is interesting. Let's take a look at how the different percentiles behave in these specific scenarios. I ran three simulations with identical parameters for 60 seconds and took a variety of measurements every second. Each simulation varied only by the load balancing algorithm used. Let's compare the medians for each of these three simulations. 
Very interesting how least connections starts with slightly worse response times, but since it's based on the current characteristics of your service, it recovers quite a bit better. That said, traditional round robin is competitive with it, and weighted round robin's actually the worst. Very, very interesting. You might not have expected it, but round robin is the best median latency. If we weren't looking at any other data points, we'd miss the full story. Let's take a look at the 95th and 99th percentiles. Again, like 95th and 99th are arguably more valuable because that will capture the worst scenarios and you really want to optimize for those. The far left of the graph suffers from a small denominator. That makes sense too. 95th and 99th, weighted 95th and 99th, and least connections. You'll see here, this is actually really interesting because the median is pretty noticeably worse with weighted round robin compared to everything else. But once you get into the 95th and 99th percentiles, the worst cases, you'll see weighted round robin actually performs really well. Fascinating, I never would have realized that. No, there's no color difference between the different percentiles for each load balancing. Yeah, it'll always, higher percentage will always be higher. I was questioning that initially, but it clicked for me. Thank you for calling it out so I can explain it to the audience. We see that round robin doesn't perform well in the higher percentiles. How can it be that round robin is a great median, but bad 95th and 99th? In round robin, the state of each server isn't considered. So you get quite a lot of requests going to servers that are idle. That's how you get the low 50th percentile. On the flip side, we are also happily sending requests to servers that are overloaded, hence the bad 95th and 99th, as well as the bad error rates too. We can take a look at the full data in the histogram form. Round robin, wait around robin, least, yeah. This is actually a really good way of visualizing this. When you take all of the requests and throw them on here, you see just how bad some of those round robin requests can get because they're on a box that's super overloaded, where the other ones are a little smarter about it. Fascinating. I chose the parameters for these simulations to avoid dropping any requests. This guarantees that we're comparing the same number of data points for all three algorithms. Let's run the simulation again, but with an increased RPS value, designed to push all of the algorithms past what they can handle. The following is a graph of cumulative requests dropped over time. Oof. This is phenomenal, by the way. Great work on this article, Sam. This is really, really good. And here we can see round robin drops significantly more requests. Weighted round robin still does, but not as much. And the least connections lasts a lot longer before it starts dropping and generally drops way less bad. Least connections handles overload much better, but the cost of doing that is slightly higher 95th and 99th percentile latencies. Depending on your use case, this might be a worthwhile trade-off. Let's take a look at this one last algorithm. If we really want to optimize for latency, we need an algorithm that takes latency into account. Wouldn't it be great if we could combine the dynamic weighted round robin algorithm with the least connections one? The latency of weighted round robin and the resilience of the least connections. Interesting. Turns out we're not the first people to have this thought. Below is a simulation using an algorithm called peak exponentially weighted moving average. This is now at the point where if I was in class, I would be cheating off somebody's homework. These are too many words that mean nothing unless you're smart. Thank you for explaining this this well, because if you had just shown me this term, I would have assumed this was above my pay grade, because it would have been. It's a long and complex name, but hey, you even point this out right after. I should read one sentence a few further, because you're going to break it down for me. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> and this looks good to me. Let's learn more about it. I've set specific parameters for the simulation that are guaranteed to exhibit an expected behavior. As someone with a lisp that they're trying to mask, this was a rough sentence. <laughs> if you watch closely, you'll notice that the algorithm just stops sending requests to the leftmost server after a while. It does this because it figures out that all the other servers are faster and there's no need to send requests to the slowest one. That will just result in requests with a higher latency. So how does it do this? It combines techniques from dynamic weighted round robin with techniques from least connections and sprinkles a little bit of its own magic on top. For each server, the algorithm keeps track of the latency from the last n requests. Instead of using this to calculate an average, it sums the values, but with an exponentially decreasing scale factor. This results in a value where the older a latency is, the less it contributes to the sum. Recent requests influence the calculation more than the old ones. That value is then taken and multiplied by the number of open connections to the server, and the result is the value we use to choose which server to send the next request to. Lower is better. Interesting. So how does it compare? Let's take a look at the 50th, 95th, and 99th percentiles. Yeah, that wins by quite a bit. This is just response time. So the worst, the 99th, is handled by quite a bit. That's like more than 10% lower. That's almost 20% lower. That's a huge gap. And then for the 95th, that's like a third. Once you hit the 50th percentile, it's pretty close. But in these second and third percentiles, that's, that's a huge difference. And it's really cool seeing it in this clear visualization. 
we see a marked improvement across the board. It's far more pronounced at the higher percentiles, but consistently present from the median as well. Here we can see the same in the histogram. Yeah, this is the difference. Like it's not huge for 90-ish percent of users, but for that 5% that has the worst case, you've massively shrunk how bad that case is for them. And when you have some users that requests are taking 2.5 seconds and you knock that to under two, that's pretty meaningful. How about dropped requests? We have round robin, weighted, least connections, and Puma again. Interesting that it's dropping more than least connections did. I figured that it would fall back on least connections, but it seems like it actually gets bad over time. Yeah, it's opportunistic as it tries to get the best latency and it sometimes leaves a server less fully loaded. I want to add here that Puma has a lot of parameters that can be tweaked. The implementation I wrote for this post uses a configuration that seemed to work well for the situations I tested it in, but further tweaking could get you better results versus least connections. This is one of the downsides of Puma versus least connections, extra complexity. Sam has more context here too. The thing that compounds it most is when you send multiple requests, which is common in the modern web. Tail latency is killer as number of requests for a single page load increases. Yep, this is pretty common. Like the homepage of Twitch makes a pretty absurd number of GraphQL requests to get the data it needs to load the page. So if you're not load balancing that correctly, good luck. Conclusion, spent a long time on this post. It shows Sam, you killed it with this. It was difficult to balance realism against ease of understanding, but I feel good about where I landed. I'm hopeful that being able to see how these complex systems behave in practice in ideal and less than ideal scenarios helps you grow an intuitive understanding of when they would best apply to your workloads. Obligatory disclaimer, you must always benchmark your own workloads over taking advice from the internet as gospel. This isn't just for benchmarking and performance. This is for a lot of things, but phenomenal call out at the end here. My simulations here ignored some real life constraints like server slow starts, network latency, cold starts, stuff like that, and are set up to display specific properties of each algorithm. They aren't realistic benchmarks to be taken at face value. They are very valuable regardless though, man. <laughs> to round this out, I leave you with a version of the simulation that lets you tweak most of the parameters in real time. Have fun. Also seems like you had a lot of success on HN, Twitter, and lobsters. Good shit. Another common thing was, how did you make this? You used Pixie.js and you're really happy with how it turned out. It's your first time using this library. It's quite easy to get grips with. Good stuff. I have not used Pixie, but it was on my list of things to try because I was doing some like game dev-ish things recently. That makes a ton of sense. And the playground is really cool. You can pick a different algorithm, control all of these variables and see the effect in real time. That's really cool. I also have to say, I massively respect the restraint of not putting this at the start because I would have been very, very tempted to open with this, but you closed with it. Once again, massive shout out to Sam. His Twitter link and the blog post will be in the description. Check those out if you're curious. Great stuff. Let me know if you want to hear more about load balancing and all these crazy backend things, because they're really interesting to me and more and more a concern as upload thing continues to scale. Thank you guys as always. See you in the next one. Peace, nerds.